Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome everyone again to another episode of our show, bringing you another fascinating guest who is helping to create a better tomorrow. Today we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Janet Dichter, who is Associate Clinical Professor uh, in the Department of Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases at City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Dichter is board certified in internal medicine, infectious diseases, and the American Academy of HIV Medicine. Uh, Dr. Dichter earned her undergraduate degree in cognitive sciences from University of California, San Diego. She went on to receive her medical doctorate uh, from Rush Medical College in Chicago. And after an internal medicine residency at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Dr. Dichter began her fellowship at UCLA's affiliated program in infectious diseases. Uh, in her clinical Clinical work. She is focused on the management of infections of the immunosuppressed. Uh, at City of Hope, she is an on site HIV specialist uh, and has an interest in treating people who are living with both HIV and cancer. Uh, she was the principal investigator involved in presenting uh, the case of the City of Hope patient, uh, a prolonged HIV 1 remission without antiretrovirals after uh, allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, of the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation donor cells for acute uh, myelogenous leukemia. Uh, she also serves as the HIV physician uh, for the first in human trial to evaluate the feasibility, safety, and engraftment uh, of zinc finger uh, nucleus genome edited CCR5 modified uh, CD34 positive uh, hemopoietic stem and progenitor cells in HIV1 infected patients. Additionally, Dr. Dichter uh, has been involved in clinical trials for evaluating certain medications for uh, difficult to treat infections in immunosuppressed patients. She is also uh, in antimicrobial stewardship, infection control, uh, and has published numerous papers on aspects of patient management with antimicrobial agents. Uh, and these papers have dealt with uh, nosocomial infections, a cost assessment of antimicrobial use, and unusual case reports, all intended to uh, teach practitioners uh, who manage these difficult uh, to treat patients. Uh, we're honored to to uh, have her with us today. Uh, Dr. Jenna Dichter, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show. Thank you. It, it's, it's great to have you with us. Uh, be, before we get into the case, I would just, you know, I, I went through a lot of your, um, you know, your peer-reviewed literature out there. You know, you're, you have so much going on in terms uh, of uh, nosocomial infections, uh, antimicrobial stewardship, uh, working on a lot of the, uh, the infectious complications of immune checkpoint inhibitors and TNF antibodies and so forth. What, what initially got you interested in, in infectious diseases? Uh, if you could tell us a couple minutes about that. Sure. Um, so, my interest in infectious diseases occurred on a beach, honestly, <laughs> many years ago when I was in college. Um, my, my dad used to give me books about all kinds of things, and he still does, actually. And um, I became fascinated with um, interesting outbreaks of uh, rare infectious diseases, um, including some exotic ones all around the world. Um, one of my favorite books at that time was called The Coming Plague by Laurie Garrett. Mm -hmm. And I just became so fascinated with um, the investigational process of infectious diseases. And that's what drew me to it. So when I started medical school, I pretty much knew this was the journey I was gonna go on. 
Excellent. Excellent. And, and what, before we get into to the very special case that, that you've been talking a lot about recently, you know, I, I was looking, you know, recently, um, you know, one of the papers you published was on um, the use of um, the, the non-immunosuppressive monoclonal antibody, uh, ibelizumab, uh, looking at patients with drug-resistant res HIV. And, you know, th this paper got me thinking because you know, we've really come a long way in 2022, thinking about a couple decades now in terms of HIV. We still have, you know, 30, 38 some odd million people out there with HIV, but we've we've come a long way from the death sentence that HIV was in the, in the 1980s to where we are today. Um, before we get into the the, the cure cases. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you view at City of Hope HIV today? I mean, with the triple drug combinations, all the, the novel mechanisms of the monoclonals that are coming, where are we in terms of pharmacotherapeutic interventions with HIV in 2022? And we'll talk curative cases in a, in a second. Sure. Um, so as you alluded to, antiretroviral therapy has changed dramatically since inception in the late 1980s, uh, early 1990s, at which time there was only one class of antiretroviral therapy available um, known as the uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And these early drugs had a number of side effects that were difficult for people to tolerate. And also resistance developed fairly rapidly when used as individual agents. It wasn't until the 1990s, the mid 1990s, when a new class of agents were introduced called the protease inhibitors. And studies showed the benefits of combination therapy. And by 1996, the concept of PART or highly active antiretroviral therapy uh, was introduced, uh, for wh which is what, um, which is when people living with HIV take a combination of at least three different medications to reduce the risk of drug resistance from developing. And this really became the standard of therapy by 1997, and death due to HIV AIDS dropped precipitously in the following years in countries where these medications were available. Early on, patients used to have to take multiple pills a day. Um, but soon combination therapy became available, allowing for people living with HIV to take fewer medications per day. And also over time, the safety profiles of these medications improved. Some of the older drugs had um, some terrible, both short-term and long-term side effect to toxicities. You know, AZT caused, um, you know, um, anemia. Um, the D drugs, peripheral neuropathy, um, pancreatitis, lactic acidosis, they almost all of them cause GI upset with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, you know, and the protease inhibitors are, uh, you know, are notorious for causing also dyslipidemias and diabetes. Um, some of the older drugs also were associated with lipoatrophy, which is the buildup of fat in certain areas of the body and loss of body fat in other areas. Um, and even some of the drugs cause neurologic side effects, um, efavirenz causing, you know, depression and anxiety and mood disturbances and vivid dreams. So, so we've come a long way. Um, nowadays, medications are much more easy to tolerate, and many patients are only on as little as one pill per day. But of course, some of these newer medications continue to have some side effects, um, most commonly weight gain and dyslipidemia. And there's also a concern with, you know, associated with that is cardiovascular disease potentially as well. But as of today, August 2022, there are currently eight different classes of antiretroviral therapies available. So, you know, there's, there's, there, there's a lot of options. Um, the thing that's hard is sometimes it's important for patients to take their medications every day because if they don't, that's when drug resistance can develop over time and HIV treatment can fail. And this can lead to people developing low CD4 counts, which in turn can be associated with the development of opportunistic infections and certain kinds of cancer. So there, and there's a number of barriers um, for people adherence to, um, people living with HIV, their adherence to taking medications. Um, some people just simply forget, or it's a hassle to have to take a pill every day. Um, but other things include, you know, more serious causes, medical issues such as mental health or emotional issues or substance abuse issues, which could be a barrier um, for medication adherence. What's really the up and coming stuff is the 
idea of injectable medications. And some of these medications really have the potential to be active for weeks to months. Um, and I've had discussions with patients in the past. They just don't like having to take a pill every day. It's like psychologically reminds them that they have HIV and, and that's, that is bothersome to them. And so right now there's um, two current injectables available. Um, one is a combination pill that requires an injection every one to two months. And the other one is the monoclonal antibody that you alluded to, ibilizumab. Now, ibilizumab is used for patients with multidrug resistant virus typically, mm -hmm. um, but I have used it on a couple of occasions as really a bridge because of the lack of drug interactions with chemotherapy. But, um, you know, for the, for the general HIV uh, population, I think that these injectables are really the future of HIV medication therapy. And, you know, the idea that someone could come in once every six months or even once a year or less frequently even to get an injection and go on their way is really exciting. Um, and, and, and what's also kind of interesting is some of these medications are being touted not just for therapy, but also for uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. So mm -hmm. that's another real possibility as well. Excellent. It's also, um, you know, one of the things that I'd also like to add is that it's important for people with living with HIV to have good treatment options because there were several years ago, there was a phrase coined U equals U, meaning that undetectable equals untransmittable. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that when people living with HIV are on medications that lead to their HIV viral load to becoming undetectable to levels very low in their blood that can't transmit the virus to others. So that doesn't mean that they're cured because if they stop taking their medication, their virus is going to rebound. But the idea is that for if everyone who has HIV, who knows they have HIV or on treatment, they can't transmit the virus to others. And then over time, fewer people could be infected with HIV, which would ultimately stop the epidemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate you laying that all out because I, I think it's important. We, I think we sort of tend to forget that in 2022, we have, as you were mentioning, these this armamentaria of HIV drugs, eight different mechanisms and so forth. Um, and now here we come to the, uh, the very unique case that you've been involved in. Um, we have on one hand, a, a leukemia patient that also had HIV getting a bone marrow transplant. On the other hand, we have and, and you can talk about sort of how many of these uh, CCR5 Delta 32 patients that are naturally uh, resistant uh, to HIV, they've come together in a very unique circumstance here, um, only the fourth case where this has ever happened. Talk a little bit about the case. Uh, obviously, you've been talking about it quite a bit in, in the news and at conferences. How, how you ultimately sort of brought these two patients together and how it sort of the accidents that happen, if you would. Sure. So um, this patient, you know, so what happened was when the City of Hope screens patients for donors and the patients are happen to be HIV positive, they're able to screen for this rare genetic mutation called the homozygous CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. And this is a very rare genetic mutation, which renders people who carry this mutation effectively resistant to most strains of HIV infection, not all, but but most. And um, it occurs in about 1% of the population. So it's, it's a rare finding. Um, and the decision is in terms of which patient, uh, which the, who the donor is, is actually a variety of factors. It's not just simply this, but right. it's their age and other, other factors. But fortunately for the City of Hope patient, the, uh, they were able, we were able to find um, a donor who was a 10 out of 10 match who carried this um, uh, rare genetic mutation that, uh, that, that was available to him. And he, it actually was the best available donor as well. Um, so the City of Hope patient achieved dual long-term remission from, um, this, from um, after this uh, uh, stem cell transplant for both of his acute leukemia and um, HIV. Um, he now has received his blood stem cell transplant over three and a half years ago. It was, uh, his transplant was in early 2019 and has been off antiretroviral therapy for almost 18 months without any evidence of HIV replicating in his body. 
and his acute leukemia also re remains in complete remission. So this patient's experience is unique from the three other previous patients who were treated with stem cell transplantations for their respective blood cancers and then achieved remission for several reasons. Um, first off, he was at the age of 63, he was the oldest person to successfully undergo stem cell transplantation with HIV and leukemia and then achieve remission from both conditions. He had also been living with HIV the longest of all the patients to date for more than 31 years prior to his transplant. He was actually diagnosed in 1988. And at that time he had um, a CD4 count less than hundred. So by definition he had AIDS. Um, and he also had received the least immunosuppressive preparative regimen prior to the transplant compared to the other previous patients. And this is the treatment that prepared the patient to receive another don uh, donor stem cells and their immune system. Following the development of a form of leukemia, for, um, which is more prevalent in people who are living with HIV later in life, um, City of Hope, we delivered a life-saving stem cell transplant for him. And the transplant was successful in achieving dual remission for several reasons. The volunteer stem cell donor had a rare genetic mutation known as the homozygous CCR5 Delta 32 mutation, which makes people resistant to contracting most strains of HIV. Um, and our patient, he was older, he received a less immunosuppressive intensive chemotherapy regimen that the City of Hope and other transplant centers have developed for older and less fit patients prior to transplant. This regimen makes an allogeneic transplant or a, a transplant from donor cells possible for this patient population to achieve remission from their respective cancer. This less intensive chemotherapy regimen is better tolerated by older patients with blood transplant with blood cancers, thus reducing the potential for transplant related complications. Um, because this patient is older, and he had lived with HIV the longest prior to his transplant and received the least immunosuppressive therapy compared to the previous patients who had achieved remission from HIV after this stem cell transplant. We now have evidence that some people living with HIV who do develop blood cancers may not need these fully intensive immunosuppressive therapies prior to transplant in order to put them into remission for both HIV and leukemia. And this is really important because people with living HIV um, due to the success of antiretroviral therapy are, are living longer and, um, and they're at a higher risk for developing cancers, including blood cancers. And this case opens up the possibility for older people living with HIV and a blood cancer to receive a transplant and achieve remission from both diseases if we're able to find a donor with this rare genetic mutation. Keeping that in mind now, uh, and for the audience, you know, once again, emphasizing that this is a, a very rare situation. Obviously, we're in, in 2022. Uh, there are, you know, we have the, the technologies coming down the pipeline in terms of the CRISPRs and the other gene editing tools. Uh, and there's stuff in the wind about, you know, can we take stem cells from elsewhere and, and modify them with these CCR5 mutations? Uh, and... and maybe make a pharmacotherapeutic or a, a biologic um, stem cell therapy that you know, we don't have to rely on this very unique population of, uh, of patients. Where would you like to see this go? Because I know, okay, so we have our, our eight therapy or eight sort of classes of HIV therapeutics now. Where do you see this going in terms of using the knowledge generated from this cutting edge work that you're doing in the clinic with this type of transplant, and then combining that with some of the innovation we see on the biotech front in terms of some of these tools. So gene editing could be another interesting approach to treating HIV. And what it does is it essentially changes an organism's DNA. Despite the advances of antiretroviral therapy, which has been amazing in the last several years, you know, it can um, suppress HIV viral replication. HIV still persists as an integrated and replication competent provirus in many different types of long-term cells in the body. And reactivation of these proviruses or viral DNA that's integrated into the host genome is thought to be the cause of rebound viremia that can be seen in people who stop their antiretroviral therapy. 
And the persistence of these reservoirs has been the major challenge for HIV cure in people. In gene therapy, there have been different types of nuclease-mediated gene editing tools which have been used um, in a variety of experiments. One example that you mentioned was CRISPR. Um, CRISPR is also known as clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. And it was discovered in bacteria where it acted as a defense system against viruses that infect bacteria or phages. And CRISPR contains small parts of the virus's genetic material that can be used to look at bacterial genes for the presence of viral DNA. So it can basically see if a bacteria is infected by a virus. And if viral DNA is detected, then CRISPR can use this enzyme that removes or edits the unwanted uh, DNA or the viral DNA. And by doing so, it then protects the bacteria from the effects of the viral infection. So there's potential here for HIV because after HIV inserts its genetic material into cells, they become activated and create more virus and ultimately die. And, um, but again, some of these cells develop this proviral DNA. Now there's been early work in mice that has shown that CRISPR can remove HIV from infected cells. And later on, um, there was another study which gathered quite a bit of press where um, in monkeys that were infected with simian immunodeficiency virus or SIV, which is very closely related to HIV, CRISPR successfully cut the SIV DNA in multiple different cells types in the body and um, appeared to be um, quite effective for um, eliminating HIV in the monkeys. So earlier this year in 20, I think it was late 2021 or early 2022, a clinical trials open up for humans using CRISPR-based HIV. And I look forward to seeing the results from that trial. It'll be very interesting to see if um, they were successful in that as well. Um, another idea behind gene therapy was actually as inspired by the Berlin patient, which is similar to the City of Hope patient who achieved HIV cure after stem cell transplantation from a donor who carried the homozygous CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. So this was done, this can be done by taking a person's T cells and then outside the body, editing the CCR5 by using a gene editing tool and then reinfusing the modified T cells where the CCR5 receptor has effectively been removed. And in fact, at City of Hope, there was a clinical or a pilot trial um, in people um, living with HIV who were found to have R5 um, infection where zinc thinker technology, which is another type of nuclease mediated gene editing tool was used for gene disruption to the CD4 cells. And in this study, the healthy HIV subjects underwent autologous transplantation, which is when um, people are transplanted by their own, with their own modified cells. And similar experiments have been done in other institutions, but to date, unfortunately, this has not yet been shown to prevent viral rebound when these people are taken off antiretroviral therapy. Other possible therapeutic options have included CAR-T therapy, which is a treatment we're using all the time here at City of Hope for cancer patients. Um, and the idea is for HIV patients, you can use CAR Ts or chimeric antigen receptor T cells, um, and they're engineered to be able to recognize and eliminate HIV infected cells. At City of Hope, researchers recently published a paper that showed uh, in a humanized mouse model, the combination of CAR T therapy with the use of a vaccine for CMV could recognize and eliminate HIV. The purpose behind the use of the CMV vaccine was that it was used to stimulate and proliferate CMV-specific T cells that expressed CAR Ts against HIV. And the findings from this trial demonstrated that there was no serious toxicity to the cells in the virus's host. And what was also interesting is that there was evidence that there, was, that there were therapeutic immune cells in the bone marrow. And what that means is that this possibly suggests that this, there may be um, this may work over time, that the, the, the potential to keep this treatment working over a very prolonged period of time if it's in the bone marrow. And City of Hope is looking forward to um, 
possibly moving forward with this work and um, start potential clinical trials in the future. I, I, I appreciate you putting that out there just so we could, so the audience could understand sort of where we are with this, it, it, but it's still, it, it still is an amazing uh, uh, clinical case and, and, and just, you know, I take my hat off to you and the team for, for being involved in it. Um, Jenna, while I have you, I know, I know that your schedule is tight and, and I just wanted to, you know, we came back to, um, you know, in the intro, you know, I talked about some of uh, the work you're doing in, uh, with nosocomial infection, uh, you know, and, and uh, the proper antimicrobial stewardship, obviously the HIV work. I just wanted to round things off because there was a couple um, a couple other papers in your uh, in the peer-reviewed literature you're involved in. I was wondering just for a few minutes, you could say a few things about both of these because they're both very interesting topics for the show. One had to do with the um, uh, the clinical trial at City of Hope that you're involved in uh, on COH04S1, which is a, a novel COVID vaccine. Can you say a few words about this? Because uh, once again, you hear a lot about COVID vaccines, but here, once again, you're focusing on uh, a potential new vaccine for immunocompromised patients. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on there? Sure. So, um, yes, the division is involved in this City of Hope COVID-19 vaccine trial. This is a synthetic attenuated modified vaccinia um, Ankara vector, and it's currently the only vaccine being studied that includes both SARS-CoV-2 spike and nucleocapsid proteins. And the possible advantage to this is that this vaccine may offer potentially greater protection against different variants. And it also may be more effective at inducing COVID-19 immunity since the platform strongly induces T cell responses, even for people who have compromised immune systems. Um, so right now we are still in the process of recruiting patients and, and seeing, seeing people who are on this trial. And we look forward to seeing some of the results from that. Excellent. Excellent. And, and one other thing, once again, if you could just say a few words about this one, because uh, it's been a topic on the show in the past from the angle of uh, inflammation and, and the concept of inflammaging, but you're also uh, involved in some work with the uh, cytomegalovirus, which, um, you know, we've discussed in the past, it, not something that uh, kills many people, but makes your life really bad and, and makes you not feel very well and it sort of has trickled down to a lot of these uh, chronic degenerative diseases that have sort of this underlying chronic inflammation component. Could you just say a few words about so some of your work in CMV? So CMV is a complication that we see after stem cell transplantation. And several years ago, a medication called Latermavir was introduced. This medication is used for prophylaxis against CMV early on in the post-transplant setting. So fortunately, Right now, we're seeing far fewer CMV infections early on, immediately after transplantation, than we had in prior years before latermavir was available. However, some patients develop CMV infection and disease later in their course after discontinuation of latermavir. And this occurs most commonly in patients who are on high doses of immunosuppressive drugs. Usually, that's because of graft versus host disease. Um, and some of these patients develop recurrent and resistant infections. The management of CMV depends not only on the efficacy of the antiviral medications that are used, but also on a patient's underlying immune system. Patients who are on profound immunosuppression, um, specifically like T-cell-specific um, immunosuppression, lack CMV-specific immune reconstitution. And as these patients sometimes get recurrent infections that are treated with multiple antiviral agents. They're also at risk for developing resistance to one or more treatments for CMV, depending on the specific gene mutations that develop, which are related to the previous antiviral medications that they had received for prior infections. At City of Hope, we had a case that we published about a patient who had pan-resistant CMV infection that is CMV infection that was resistant to all antiviral medications available for treatment for CMV. And this is because of mutations that developed in the virus that render the typical medications that we use um, ineffective. And we tried, we opted to try combination therapy, which is not a standard approach in CMV, but there have been case reports describing combination therapy previously and we specifically selected two medications to treat our patient with Maraviroc and Latermavir, 
where there's been evidence that it may be effective or additive when used in laboratory settings. And the rationale for our approach is that combination therapy is used in the management of other viral infections, most notably HIV and hepatitis C. And by targeting more than one stage in the infection and replication stop cycle of the virus with two different medications and potentially avoiding the potential of cross resistance, we thought there could be a better chance of success for this patient. And we showed just that. Um, our patient was treated successfully with these two medications for a CMV. He had no evidence of rebound infection and experienced no toxicity. So it's possible that we prevented the development of resistance to either individual agent if either of them had been used as a single drug. Because of this case and other cases that have been published, it's possible in the future that we may be seeing more combination therapy for people who have drug-resistant CMV infection or disease. I appreciate outlining that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an amazing clinical portfolio you have there. And uh, obviously, uh, we, we've heard a lot about you in the, in the, in the press uh, from the HIV work, but you have so much else going on, and it's just really uh, exciting. And, and we're wishing you uh, and your team the best with all of these programs uh, that are so, just so very important. Um, uh, for, for everybody that is going to be listening to this uh, particular episode um, uh, across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to Dr. Jenna Dichter uh, at City of Hope Medical Center. Uh, Jenna, I, I want to thank you again for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while about all these themes. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing there at City of Hope. And as we like to say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people out there via the work you're doing. It's very, very impressive and wishing you the best with all of it. Thank you.